Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. okay, thank you for coming and good evening. My name is Rafiq Gubran, and uh, I am the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Design, and I'm also a graduate of uh, the Faculty of Engineering and Design. I had my PhD from here in 87. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you here all today, uh, particularly our guest of honors, Michael Copeland, Miles Copeland, Miles, yeah, Miles Copeland, Jim White, John Knight. So welcome to them and their families. Roy Boothroyd was not able to join us here today, but he shares in the celebration with his uh, spirit with us. So I know many of you traveled from far to be here, and I'm glad you could join the alumni, students, and faculty of the Department of Electronics on this very special night. So every researcher, student, and teacher in the Department of Electronics helps form the department in some way, but tonight we honor the knowledge, leadership, and innovation of Roy, Miles, John, and Jim, who have founded and shaped the department. Now, these professors forged ties between industry and the university. They educated so many students, and this is evident by the number of people who, uh, uh, who uh, came today. So they elevated Carlton's research enterprise to the international stage, and they influenced the research and career path of thousands of colleagues and alumni. So uh, uh, I'd like also to mention many other faculty members who played a major role in establishing the Department of Electronics. And there are many of them, I'll mention a few more, uh, other than uh, Miles, Roy, and uh, uh, John and Jim. So uh, Chong Chan, for example, has uh, done major contributions, Patrick Vanderpoo, uh, Robert Harrison, and the late David Walkie. So we thank them as well for all of their contributions. So uh, I also would like to thank Nagy Mikhail, who's been the brain behind this uh, event. So thank you, Nagy. So we've got a full program of speakers ahead. We'll start the evening off with some words from Carlton President, and then we'll begin dinner, and guest speakers will share memories about each of our honorees. So uh, we'll hear about uh, details about some uh, stories and some event that took place. Uh, we'll then uh, open the floor for other memories at the end of the program. And of course, uh, we'll have uh, the night ahead of us to celebrate and to mingle and to talk to each other. So to start off the program, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our president and vice chancellor, uh, Dr. Roseanne orali -Rante. Thank you very much, Rafiq, and what a great dean we have, don't we? Let's give him a round of applause. This is a fabulous evening. I am so thrilled to see each and every one of you here. Thank you all for coming. Together, you have conquered distance. You've come from near and far. You've conquered time. Some of you were here a long time ago, and some of you are still here. You have done it all in the name of community and friendship. And I think that when Carleton was founded, we were a university that was founded by the people, by the community. And it was a university where people were really important. And it is something that hasn't changed at all. People are the key and the important part of this institution. If you think about it, it's the great professors. And for the professors, it's the great students. So why don't you give each other a round of applause? Now, it's really fitting that you come to this building for your dinner. Um, some people might say that this building is symbolic of what we do so well at Carleton University. First of all, in order to build the building, we moved the road. 
And to me, that says that at Carleton University, we can do anything. We can move roads. There's no obstacle that is too great to be solved. And I think that engineering is really key because we would never have gotten the building over the road if it weren't for the engineers. Now, the political scientists will say they had a part in it because the National Capital Commission didn't want us to move the road, but I think that the engineers were the ones that actually did the moving. So congratulations to the engineers because you show that anything is possible. If you look at the, when you come into the building down below, you see a beautiful sculpture that says sailing through time. And that sculpture is also symbolic of our community. Um, it was a 200 year old willow tree that was in Old Ottawa South. The tree was falling down and had to be cut down. And the students came and said to me, you know, couldn't we make a sculpture out of it and bring it to campus? And we found a sculptor who would like to do this. And I said, that would be really great, except that the people in Old Ottawa South are really mad about that tree coming down. And if we get the tree, then they're going to be mad at Carleton. And so we have to manage to uh, conquer this situation. So the students went door to door in Old Ottawa South and persuaded the population that the tree indeed was ill, it needed to be chopped down, and that it would make a wonderful sculpture at Carleton University. And if you see the tree, it's a hollow sculpture because the whole tree was rotten in the inside. Nothing has been changed. That is the shape of the tree. The hollowed out part simply fell out. But if you look at it, it's standing on its branches. The sculptor turned it upside down. And I like to think that that's really what happens when you go to university. You learn to think in a different way. You learn to look at things in a different way. You learn to be creative. You learn to conquer the obstacles that people set up, the obstacles that nature provides, and you create beautiful things. And one of the most beautiful things that's been created at this university is not this building, but it's the people here. So thank you all very much. Thank you for coming back, those of you who are being honored tonight. Thank you for sharing your time and your talents with us. Thank you for allowing us the privilege and pleasure of applauding you and recognizing all that you have done. But thank each and every one of you for making that effort, for participating in it, for being here on a historic evening when we celebrate excellence, community, and a wonderful future for a university where moving roads is only the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ranti. And uh, now I'd like to add also my personal thanks and uh, appreciation to John, Jim, Miles, and Roy. So actually, I've had the opportunity here to interact with the uh, four of them as a student, as, as a young professor as well. And the amount of, of encouragement, feedback, and help that I've received from them has been really great. So thank you very much for your contribution to me as well. Miles Copeland and taught by and worked with these professors. I took courses from most of them. Many of you have worked closely with them as colleagues or students and know the energy and innovation they brought to Carleton. The research and teaching areas they started at Carleton have continued to grow. Just look at the expansion of the exceptional microfabrication facilities and the growth of our labs. And if you've not had a tour, you should certainly ask for one. Over time, with your generous support, we will create a lasting tribute to their careers and their gifts. We have already raised nearly $30,000 to begin to equip and transform a facility here on campus with cutting edge, high frequency, equipment and hardware computer upgrades and innovative research stations so that the future of electronic students have access to top high frequency laboratory in Canada. Sorry, that should be to the top high frequency laboratory in Canada. 
And some of our current work in this area is being displayed in the back if you haven't seen it yet. So also with a plaque for each of our honorees, similar to the one shown up here, the Transform Lab will be a perfect tribute to our four colleagues, the professors who elevated the department with their wisdom and dedication. And I would also like to point out that many of you who have made contributions are in this room today, so we'd like to give you a special thank you as well. Now we would like to pay tribute to our uh, special uh, honored guests here today, or to our uh, honored faculty members. So I would like to welcome Bob Hathaway to speak about Roy Boothroyd and Miles Copeland. Bob worked with Roy and Miles in the 1980s during his time at NARTA. Thank you all for your time. Uh, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to say a few words about these gentlemen. Professor Roy Boothroyd and Professor Miles Copeland. Both played instrumental roles in creating high technology education, innovation, in semiconductor technology, and heavily influenced my professional career. I will be forever thankful for their mentorship, guidance, and friendship. The Canadian high technology scene will be forever changed by these individuals. I'm going to ask for your indulgence, and I'm going to focus my short talk on personal and professional experience with these two fellows. I'm going to take you for a short trip down memory lane. Both were involved in sponsored research at Bell Northern Research when I arrived as a new hire. And I rarely tell anyone this in 1976. By the time I arrived, Roy had been involved with BNR for 10 years. A quiet and determined fixture, he was contributing to the fledgling modeling effort for MOX and bought this off by polar device called R squared L. Roy introduced me to the world of semiconductor modeling with all its interplay between fabrication processes, internal device physics, and helped me link it to my expertise at the time, which was circuit design. It was a real treat. I spent many hours sitting in front of a shoe-sized box, a shielded box containing batteries, the needle probes that we used to connect to the endless array of I-squared L devices on the two-inch wafers. Given the instrumentation at the time, um, painstaking is probably the best way to describe that effort. Roy was a fantastic mentor, clear, concise, and incredibly patient. And he often needed to be, because I often brought results back to him from the lab that were uh, illegible, indecipherable, and sometimes just downright wrong. I often used the excuse that the transistor was upside down and that it made no sense to me. Roy then would calmly go over why it was incredibly fortuitous that the bipolar transistor could be made to work in both directions. I know as Giles is in the audience tonight. Um, years later, when I was handsomely compensated for what turned out at the time to be a freelance I squared L design, I fully appreciated Roy's mentorship and education. Following this introduction to Dr. Boothroyd, I was hooked. I watched his efforts in MOS modeling with wonder. This effort lasted through the years up to 1998 and followed Moore's curve from 10 microns down to half a micron or less. He was responsible for the strong device physics approach to modeling at Nortel, helping ensure many generations of NMOS and CMOS <clears throat> circuits um, products function flawlessly with stellar yields. His achievements fundamentally changed the Canadian and international high-tech scene. And in addition, he introduced me to Dr. Copeland, who was also at Bell Northern Research before I arrived. Miles was involved in the very early efforts to create integrated circuits known as filter codecs for use in large digital switching machines. It was a heady time at BNR. We were in competition with AT&T Bell Labs to see who would dominate the North American telephone switching business, and Miles was right in the middle of it with his groundbreaking work on switch capacitor filters. A few short years after the switch capacitor filter innovations occurred, Nortel was manufacturing filter codecs in volumes approaching 10 million a year. The, reach complete, the research completed by Miles and his BNR colleagues enabled Nortel to dominate the international digital switching market for decades, demonstrating not only the academic achievement, but the indisputable economic impact. 
I came to know Miles personally years later. He approached me with an opportunity to co-mentor a graduate student, now Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, who is also in the audience this evening. I jumped at the chance. The experimental work was carried out exclusively on the Nortel campus. Both Lakshmi and Miles were in residence often. The association led to a publication in 86 where we described how to enable precision analog design using component performance matching. This work has become one of the most cited papers in the Journal of Solid State Circuits, 511 at last count, and is in the top 10. It was at this point the collaboration with Carleton University really ramped. From 1986 to 1999, Miles and Roy introduced Nortel to many professors, among them Dr. Plett, who you just met, Dr. Tarr, and, and many others. <clears throat> and of course, there were the students. I do not have a factual count, but I can sh share with you that at times I would show up at work in the morning, and this is not a lie, I would show up at work in the morning, and there were more Carleton students in my laboratory than there were full-time staff. They were keen, and they worked hard. This collective of students and staff became known as the University of Nortel. It was always a challenge to find the funding and a place for them to sit. The rewards were worth it, with both Carlton and Nortel benefiting. We had many first in silicon devices and circuits centered in optical and wireless communications. Many of these functional design techniques have been used within Nortel and later Siena, where I work today, Ericsson, and other companies. In Siena's case, some of the these techniques have demonstrated incredible longevity, finding their way into the latest of our products at 100 gig transport. All driven by the energy, commitment, and innovation Miles brought to the, to the effort every day. Congratulations, Miles and Roy, on your deserved, well-deserved recognition. Actually, uh, Bob, you were supposed to invite Miles to come and say a few words now. So, Miles, you don't need an invitation. Excellent. Okay, um, thank you, Bob, for your very nice remarks. Uh, I and other members of the department have many pleasant memories of our interaction with Northern Telecom under various names. I'm glad that this event happened before I lost my memory and could no longer enjoy it. Uh, I have been watching the signs for that uh, lately. This is why I'm uh, referring here to these notes. Sometimes I start a sentence these days and forget where I'm going by the end. So, um, thanks to the Carlton Pension Plan, it's been a comfortable retirement. <laughs> I think that the uh, accountants or annuitants or whatever, annuitants or whatever they call them that set up the Carlton Pension Plan didn't realize how the human lifespan was going to increase uh, during, before the payouts began for the Carlton Pension Plan. So thank goodness for that. We're very grateful. Uh, Roy Boothright has been retired longer than me. He's in tolerable health and has, but has a lot of responsibility for caring for his wife, Jean. And that's a big reason why he's not here tonight. I'm sorry that he can't be here. Roy came to Carleton to become the first chairman of the Department of Electronics. In fact, the department was created precisely to convince him to come from his previous university, which was Queens in Belfast. He served as chairman for many years. I became the chairman after that. Roy was instrumental in the setting up of the semiconductor laboratory, which Lal Burnt, who's here tonight, ran, and who Gary Tarr was uh, was uh, the professor in charge. I myself was more interested in the design of integrated circuits, which led me to the strong connection to Northern Telecom. In the department, we had excellent facilities in the teaching of computer aid design of integrated circuits, or we call it VLSI design. Initially, we set up for student use on our own facility using a, lo a, a local area network, or LAN, of Corvus computers and our own creation of design tools. This was before there was much going on in other Canadian universities. This was set up by Dunklin Glendening, who's here tonight, and Graham Bell. Later, the importance of doing this sort of thing was recognized across Canada, and NSERC provided funds 
to Canadian universities for much more sophisticated hardware and design tools, software tools, through the Canadian Microelectronics Corporation, or CMC. We incorporated all this into the department, uh, and we now have, uh, are now, now have outstanding capability in teaching VLSI design, <coughs> and we've attracted very many exceptional students. I want to now make some remarks about Nagy McHale, who was responsible for initiating this gala. Uh, Nagy was the major, a major force in the innovation and evolution of the Department of Electronics hardware and structure for VLSI design, as well as in our graduate and undergraduate departments, uh, laboratories. He didn't need to be clearly led. He was always a few steps ahead of the technology and the professors at times. Not all professors like that. They, they like to give the orders to what's to be done and don't like to be told, uh, or suggested what they should do. But he, he had such great initiative uh, that uh, I personally feel a great affection for him and his work in the department I was chairman of, as did Roy Boothright. I also believe many undergraduate and, under, and graduate students feel the same. Would, would, would uh, those to whom those applied here raise their hands? I see a bunch of students at the back. So I would like to, for us to give a big attaboy here for his many contributions. Okay, next. Thank you. Uh, we'll now welcome Mark Wyville, who received his PhD in 2011 and his Carleton bachelor's and master's degree before that. Mark was one of the more than 100 students that have been supervised by Jim White. Mark. So I'm going to start by um, asking everyone to think back of their uh, very last day of their undergrad, last day of classes. Remember um, back then there was excitement in the air because um, you're almost done. All you had left to do was your exams and then land a job. Well, I remember this day vividly because this wasn't the first day that I met Jim White, but this is the day that he gave me some advice, um, unexpected, that changed my life, shaped my life. <laughs> The advice I was looking for was on uh, job opportunities. Jim had a reputation for having a strong connection with the industry. But um, the advice he gave me was to go on to grad school and do it now, not down the road. So I followed his advice, and I stepped onto the multi-floor escalator. That's a term that Jim's coined to describe the process of connecting his students with industry. And at that point, he steered me and all the other students on the escalator to make sure we didn't fall off and to make sure that um, he removed any barriers so that our research was only ever limited by our own ability. So this story begins a little different for every one of Jim's uh, grad students, but uh, it ends the same uh, for everyone. And that's we step off the escalator, and um, we have a degree, of course, but also we have our own personalized connection with industry, and for many of us, that's launched our careers. But I have to be careful, since if I speak too much about Jim as a supervisor, then um, I'm only really speaking on behalf of his former and current grad students, which um, isn't that small of a number, if, uh, as evident by the 108 red and blue books that are being used to test the strength of the bookshelves in his office. <laughs> so it's not easy to find someone who specializes in almost every aspect of a wireless device. I'm referring to antennas, uh, chipset architecture, the synchronization, the MIMO math, etc. And it's even rarer to find someone um, to uh, be an authority in so many different fields, talking about electronic warfare, uh, telecommunications, radar, satellite communications. Now, Jim White is one of the few in the world with these credentials. Now, if that person with all these credentials also has dedicated their career to teaching and inspiring others with the patience of a professor, and this person also has the entrepreneurial uh, energy and uh, spirit to start uh, start up co-found multiple startups, then Jim White's the only one left standing. With Jim's career as an example, we've all learned that when we're in our 20s or 30s, we don't need to uh, lock our careers into a certain field or technology. We don't need to choose whether to specialize or generalize. If we're passionate about lifelong learning, then we can do it all, like Jim does. And that's liberating, but it's perhaps a little overly optimistic. 
And I say overly optimistic because when I was 25 years old, I was just finishing up my master's degree. Um, when Jim was 25 years old, he was a university professor. So perhaps maybe that can just serve as an aggressive target for some of the younger students uh, when they're looking for some motivation. Now, if you are one of those students, one of the thousands of students who have sat through one of Jim's courses, then you know that Jim's style of teaching involves a lot of testimony which is drawn from his experience. These stories are an effective way to connect what we're learning with, with real life. And with every story, we get to learn a little bit more about Jim. And as the course progresses, we really get to see how much he enjoys his work. We'd say, wow, this guy's having the time of his life. His research is on the leading edge of wireless. He's always involved with some company. He even seems to enjoy teaching this course, even though it might be his 36th time teaching it. It's a great atmosphere for learning uh, when the students admire and respect the professor. His role models like Jim White create this positive atmosphere in the classroom, which can really ingrain a culture of lifelong learning. And this ingrained culture is one reason why Carleton grads have been so successful. So I'm truly honored to take part in the celebration today, since it's brought so many of us back here to celebrate our roots at Carleton which for me includes a grateful acknowledgement to Jim White. And uh, as part of my current job, I still have the pleasure of uh, continuing to collaborate with Jim and look forward to many more years. With that, I'd like to invite uh, Jim Ford. Mike. I'm really impressed with this gathering. I have to say that when Nagy first uh, spoke to me about it, I thought <coughs> this is maybe not a good idea. Uh, that a lot of people would have the best of intentions, but that it probably wouldn't be too successful. This is wildly successful. And the thing that really impresses me is not everybody who is here actually is living currently in Ottawa. So we have quite a few people who have traveled all over North America uh, in order to be here with us tonight. I'm not going to say too many things. Uh, mostly what I want to do is uh, meet with you uh, after the formalities and uh, reacquaint uh, ourselves with uh, some of you who I haven't seen for uh, up to 10 years, maybe sometimes longer. Uh, so really all I want to do is say uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jim. And uh, now to share his memories of John Knight, please welcome Gord Allen. So, uh, Gord received his PhD in 2009, and I believe he was the last graduate student supervised by John. So, Gord. Hello, hello everyone. John, thank you. And thanks to Calvin for inviting me tonight and giving me the opportunity to say a few words. I met John interviewing for the PhD program in uh, late 2001. It was shortly after 9-11, uh, uh, shortly after the crash of the tech industry in a lot of the areas here, uh, shortly after the crash of the stock market, and coincidentally, shortly after the crash of John off his roof. <laughs> when I met him, he'd finished rehab and, and, and he'd come back to work. I mean retirement. Because John's been retired for the past 12 years, uh, except you wouldn't know it, because he was teaching more, he's in the office more, he's around for his students more than most prof, profs on the floor. And he was always there for, for me and for all the other students around, uh, despite being in retirement, uh, much to Norma's chagrin. Well, when I, when I approached John in 2001 and asked to you know, start the, the PhD program, uh, he was reluctant. Uh, he was near what he was hoping was the tail end of his last PhD student, a guy by the name of Fred Ma, who was on a lifelong learning plan. <laughs> And uh, so he said to me, he said, uh, you know, I'm retired. Uh, I'm not taking any more students, although I'd really love to help you out. Uh, so I'll only take you on if you get a co-supervisor, because he didn't want to be too committed. 
So I had a short telephone interview with uh, another professor from the systems department, and I wasn't quite sure until tonight whether he knew he was actually my co-supervisor for a short amount of time. Thank you, Rafiq. <laughs> So I'd done my bachelor's and my master's at Queen's University, uh, a great re university with a, an amazing reputation and uh, a great party university too. So when, when I came here, I, I thought, like many, that you know, I had a good handle on things. I knew, I knew sort of technically I was r relatively strong. At least I thought that until I sat in Calvin's graduate RFIC course. <laughs> and soaked it up like a sponge. It was amazing to, to be in the environment here, to learn so much uh, from, from the faculty here, their connections with industry. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, to, to have that, that great practical connection that the profs here have. So uh, that's a testament to not only John and Calvin, but, but the whole community here and the legacy of Nortel and everything around. So now, I lament for a little bit that often when I see engineers, uh, digital engineers come in for interviews and, and, and we're looking to hire a digital engineer now if you happen to know one, but uh, they'll come in and they won't necessarily know, that they'll think software and they'll think, oh, they, they won't necessarily know what those little innocuous lines of Verilog turn into, right? And that's not a problem with the years and years of students who ever went through one of John Knight's courses, right? The, they have the intuitive understanding that he ingrained into them, uh, and you don't have to take my word for it. You know, some random samplings of students, there's so much respect for John Knight when I go out there and I say, you know, I was his student. You know, people's face light up. He, he ran the bridge camp here, which helped Students who, not students, but people from industry who are potentially down on their luck in the, in the tech recession to learn new skills and retrain. Some comments taken as a random sampling off a website that will remain name nameless. Best prof at Carleton. 20 years later, I still use everything he taught me. Took his course years ago. An excellent prof who lives for his students and is always ready to give his all. Tough, but realistic, given the quality of his teaching and availability. Great sense of humor, too. Without question, the most engaging professor I ever had. Teaches you the material and expects you to understand it. Make sure you take him. John Knight is the absolute best prof ever. Highly dedicated to quality teaching and to helping his students succeed. Tough, but he holds up his end with amazing lectures. So... That, that's the, the sentiment from the students who've gone through the program with John. From my own personal perspective, you know, I, I came in with wild ideas. Uh, I was always trying to figure out what to do next. Oftentimes, my little research projects of interest had tenuous, if at all, any connection to anything that might look like a thesis. And John was always very, very supportive. Aside from one particular project I thought of working on for a bit, where I actually saw him scowl. He was not too happy about me doing an online poker player bot. <laughs> I would anxiously await the bell of his wheelchair to announce his arrival as he passed the blue room. So I could go and poke him and learn about the follies of my next great idea. His breadth is amazing, and his tolerance of my technical ADD, as it were, was even more so. From software-defined radio, DSP, tunnel diodes, and everything in between. It's through his support and the broad education that he's created that the great engineers of today and tomorrow are around this city. A PhD is supposed to take about four years. Mine took eight. Fred's took longer. I'd like to think that it's with his encouragement to go and explore things shiny that me and those like me have sort of taken the, the road less traveled. And for that, it has made all the difference. Thank you, John. So, and, and thank you, Nagy. I'd like to bring John up to the, to the stage now and get a few words from him. Okay, I'm here to provide backup for John. Uh, in case he runs out of things to say, which is very unlikely. About right, I think. 
Some people can't see me. That's all right. Okay. You got a different view from up here. Okay. Well, I just want to thank all these encouraging comments that people have made about me. I don't, don't say I believe them all, but it's nice to hear them. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, uh, I can't get over all the nice things they've said. And I don't, want to, I don't want to say too much because, well, you don't say too much. I can see people, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. And I guess I really don't have too much more to say. I, I had a few more things to say in case we ran out of things, but I think Gord Allen has done such a wonderful job, it's hard to improve on it. So uh, thank you on behalf of John and of the other three professors being honored tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Miles and John. John, we're not done with you yet. We're not done with you yet. So uh, John Knight has Why been not? John Knight has been like a father to a lot of the students here, spending late hours and late nights. So we have a number of students here who would like to honor John Knight as well. And uh, so there's a number of students that were in various courses and in various uh, acti activities. So if those students could come <laughs> forward, please, with their uh, presentation. So we would be joined by Eric Willis, Adam Orrell. Katie Sidwell, and possibly other students who were going to join in this tribute as well. I'm not sure if, uh, if there are others. All right, can I get all the other recent grads and current students up here as well? Everyone, third years, fourth years, master students. I just want like, all the new generation of the Department of Electronics up here with me. Yeah, don't crash the stage either. You can stand in the front if you want to stand in the front as well. I don't want to fall. Okay, so good evening professors, current students, former students, and other esteemed guests. My name is Eric Willis, the president of the Carleton Student Engineering Society. In the past five years, I've had the pleasure of being taught by some amazing professors in the Department of Electronics, including two being honored here tonight. Also, pretend like you don't know I'm honoring John Knight. It's a surprise. Uh, this leads me to why I'm standing here tonight. Last month of Reflections, our end of the year formal dinner, we presented an award to a man who inspired and influenced many students in electrical, computer systems, sustainable and renewable energy, and even people like me in aerospace electronics. His dedication to the students enabled them to excel and exceed in courses many would have found otherwise difficult. His analogies made learning switching circuits, or ELAC 2607, um, as current students know it, enjoyable to say the least. He was often found in labs helping students any way he could at any hours of the day. While not officially in his lecture section, I did attend a few and was forced to pay attention, not only because he was a great lecturer, because, uh, but because if he asked me a question, I didn't know the answer, I didn't want to look too silly. Um, he inspired many to continue on with digital design and even just electrical engineering in general. Anyone who has read his notes know that you can start reading them without knowing anything and at the end, be almost an expert, or in some of our cases, have a lot of questions. 
Uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to present on behalf of the Carleton Student Engineering Society, all the students here, and all the others who could not be here tonight, the Outstanding Commitment to Student Success Award to Dr. John Knight. So thank you, Katie, Eric, and Adam, and all the other students who were here to honor John Knight. So we've got somebody else to thank tonight as well. Rafiq uh, will join me here. And uh, so tonight's celebration for our friends, Miles, Jim, John, and Roy, would not have happened if it weren't for the dedication and tireless efforts of another person who's been integral in shaping the Department of Electronics. Maggie Mikhail. So, uh, So, Nagy has been part of the Carleton community for more than 30 years. I think it's 34 years, actually. Uh, and in the labs with the students, he sees the impact of our teaching and research and students more, perhaps, than we do ourselves. And I thank you, Miles, for making that commentary about him as well. And so, when Nagy says we need to say thank you to these great men, we listened. I know Nagy contacted many of you personally to make this happen tonight. He's been a whirlwind of activity for many months now getting this going. Thank you, Nagy. We would like to please accept this token of our appreciation. We have something for you here. I just want to take the occasion to say one word. Uh, I'm not usually a good speaker, uh, but I know when something comes from the heart, uh, how it feels like. Yes, it's been very emotional for me, for too many people, to take 34 years and compress them in a month and a half and get in touch with so much memories and good memories. I want to say one thing very, very, very important here. It's the wives of the faculty that suffered when we miss and stay till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Yet we know we have a family to take care of. Norma, thank you for all your contribution. I think without you, I don't think John Knight will be enjoying uh, taking care of all those that we consider his children, too. So that makes Alan and brothers, you have a big family. And I would say the same thing for Miles Copeland's Margaret and probably Professor Boothroyd. This is something behind the scenes. We see it, and it's very important to acknowledge it. Thanks, Norma. Thanks, Margaret and Jane. That's not here. And for sure, uh, Irina. Thanks. But uh, if anybody has anything to say. Phil Lafleur is going to start off. Hi, uh, I'm Phil Lafleur. I, w I was a grad student of... Uh, of Jim White and a, a very uh, enthusiastic student of uh, John Knight's as well. I want to start off with a John Knight story. And uh, I remember in, uh, uh, in digital circus class thinking that it was so, I was still uh, in second year and I was still enthralled by meeting all these professors with this incredible level of knowledge and, uh, and uh, a little bit intimidated uh, at times with uh, meeting certain professors, 
This was not the case with, uh, with Professor Knight. He right away made you at ease. He told jokes in class, things like that. And uh, one of my favorite jokes I still remember to this day was uh, we were studying different types of flip-flops, uh, which are a common digital circuit. And Professor Knight pointed out the JK flip-flop, which was, of course, named after him. So, <laughs> so I remember that. That was a great, a great icebreaker to start off in that area. And then uh, my, uh, my story on, on Professor White is a story of, uh, of dedication, really. The, uh, I remember in, uh, uh, in my uh, late undergrad, beginning of grad school, Professor, Knight ha or Professor White had a horrible back problem. And he was still teaching his classes. He was still supervising his grad students. I even went to visit him in his office and he didn't have a chair in his office. And I asked him, well, why don't you have a chair? And he said, I can't sit down. And later on, I found out that when he would ex mark exam papers, he'd lie on his stomach and, and work on his exam papers. And throughout this time, his students were completely unaware of this problem. And he, w he suffered, and in every lecture, he was standing, and I guess standing was, was uh, enough uh, that the painkillers could knock it down so that he could, he could take it. But it was absolutely remarkable to see that he was still teaching with the, the, the enthusiasm and passion that he had uh, despite this, uh, this ailment. And then the uh, last story on Jim White is uh, that uh, I remember seeing him in the hallway and he had this goofy grin on his face and I asked him what was going on and he told me that he was gonna be a dad. And that was the other moment. <laughs> he, was, he said, I'm way too old to be a dad, but I'm going to be a dad. And that was a, a magical moment. And it's beautiful to see him and, and Irene and, and the other Irene as well. So that's it for me. Thank you, Phil. Uh, one thing I remember about John Knight is twinkle, twinkle, little star, V equals I squared R. <laughs> So I have learned something as well. Uh, anybody else have a comment to make? Okay, so I'm not a graduate from Carleton University. Uh, my name is Dave Roscoe. Um, I'm actually a graduate from the University of Manitoba. And uh, Jim was actually my external examiner uh, during my PhD uh, defense. And, uh, but I'm not going to talk, I don't actually want to talk about, um, you know, the education and, and uh, technical and whatnot. But I wanted to highlight what Jim and I think the rest of these three, uh, other three individuals have brought um, to our lives is uh, something that's not technical. It's all about um, connections with people. And uh, Jim, uh, through his work, he is actually, uh, as a proponent with uh, working with industry and whatnot, has brought a lot of people together. And in my world, and I, I would uh, probably uh, bet a bottle of scotch, which I usually, that's my betting uh, uh, metric, is that my world is the same as your world is that in my world, uh, through Jim's work with uh, bringing uh, uh, different universities and different people together, I've actually spent, uh, met um, individuals through uh, Jim's work uh, that have become lifelong friends uh, for the last 15, 20 years for myself. And I'm sitting with the table with uh, um, friends that I've had for a long time, when I was doing graduate work, Angis, Sean, Phil and Daryl and uh, Julie, and uh, it's it's that component which I think is uh, I really value what uh, Jim has brought to my life, and uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Jim Kendall, and I was one of Roy Boothroyd's masters and PhD students, and in fact I worked with Roy for six years both here at Carleton and I was one of the graduates of the University of Northern Telecom, Bob. And 
uh, proud of it. So I was at Nortel for five years before they ever hired me, and then worked for an... Ad <laughs> I say the only guy who got a five-year pin without having actually been hired. So then I worked for an additional seven years at Nortel, again with Roy as the consultant in our device modeling group. So in total, I worked with him for 13 years. But one of the amazing things I learned from Roy as the years rolled by, that I would come to him with device physics problems because I was you know, doing device modeling as he was. And we would just take a piece of paper and a pencil and we would draw whatever transistor structure, cross section, whatever. I'd say, Roy, how does this work? And he would explain it to me. And after a while it dawned on me, I was speaking to a human electromagnetic simulator. <laughs> because he had an intuitive feel for how everything worked electromagnetically. And he could explain it to you in English and make you understand it. And eventually he actually taught me this skill. Now the other amazing thing was his understanding of people and what they were capable of. And the, the personal um, thing that uh, happened to me was I set on my PhD and eventually realized that what I needed to do was to solve the two-dimensional Poisson's equation, current continuity equation for a short channel MOSFET, which was something that no one had ever done before. And Roy believed I could do this. And after working on this for about two years, finally it came down to one line of mathematics, which you know, I won't go into the details, but it was calculating a series of Fourier coefficients from ridiculously complicated conditions. I went through every mathematics professor here at Carleton University, and every one of them said, I have no idea what you do. And Roy said, you will solve this. I said, Roy, I've done enough to give me the PhD. Give me the PhD. I, you know, don't, don't you think I've done enough? No, no, he said, no, you can do this. He knew not just the electric and magnetics, but he knew people too. And he knew I could do it. So for nine months, I got up every morning. I looked at that line of mathematics and I said, I can solve this. I'm sure I can. And after nine months, I lay there on the couch for three days. And every once in a while, I get up, I run down the canal. And I'd come back and I'd lay on the couch. And then it dawned on me, I had the wrong state variables. And I solved the equation and I got my PhD. But a lot of that is because Roy believed in me and believed I could do it. So I'd just like to thank Roy, even if in, in absentia, and remember what a great professor he was. Thank you. Hello, I'm Spruce Riordan. And I served for many years just a minute, got to get this sorted. There we are. For many years as a faculty member in the sister department of systems and computer engineering at Carleton. And I just want to give you a few brief recollections about these four fine gentlemen. Roy Boothroyd. I started my career, actually I was an electronics guy. I was a, a circuit designer. I was a vacuum tube circuit designer. <laughs> well, actually I've moved on a bit since then. But... Uh, Eventually, I got into transistors, and every so often, somebody, and I was working for NRC, National Research Council, every, every so often, someone would come along and say, I've got this new circuit that, that's just been published by this guy called Roy Boothroyd. And I stood in considerable awe of this unknown person from Britain, Roy Boothroyd. So it was a, a real pleasure for me to find uh, that in uh, 1968, uh, he, in fact, I guess it was earlier than that. He, he uh, took on the job of chairman at Carleton of electronics, and I subsequently, uh, s some years later, became chairman of systems and computer engineering, and we worked together really well. I thought Roy was just a terrific guy in every way, as a human being, as people have said, as, as a professor. I want to talk about John Knight for a moment. Um, John had a lot of ability in many di different directions, and one of them was teaching. He was just excellent as a teacher. And my daughter went through civil engineering, and she had to take a course from John Knight in electronics, and boy, her interest in electronics was about minus 60 dB. <laughs> so, but she remembers. John, and I want, to, I want to correct the earlier rhyme or add to it. And John, you can tell me if this is right. Up above the world so high, no, sorry, gotta start with twinkle, twinkle. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, 
power equals I squared R. Up above the world so high, power isn't R squared I. And all these people in civil engineering and the likes weren't quite sure if it was I squared R or R, I squared, or R squared I. And after John's little rhyme, my daughter's never, never forgotten this 20 years ago. Miles Copeland. Miles was a guy who was passionate about his research, but also his department. And in later years, I was Dean of Engineering, and I remember dealing with Miles Copeland when we were getting the, what was then the new building, the, um, uh, the, 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 the now known as the Case Building. Um, and we were trying to figure out what facilities we'd have in it for the different departments. And Miles was very strong on the whole idea that we must have a state-of-the-art uh, microelectronics fabrication facility. And this meant, you know, one of the, one of the problems we had was uh, the train goes by and everything shakes. And we, uh, with Miles pushing this, we got through this and we had a, a suspended floor on the whole business. I remember Miles being so keen on that. And then Jim. I'm going to tell a story, Jim, that I haven't told anybody else. It was just you and me. Jim used to do a lot of consulting. And I, I, I was dean of engineering, and Jim was chairman of, uh, of electronics. And I think Jim sometimes wondered whether he was going a little far in doing consulting, and was, was he, was he uh, really neglecting any duties here at Carleton? I can tell you straight away, he was not. So I remember saying to Jim, well, what are you doing now in the way of consulting? And Jim looked at me and said, I'm telling this to Spruce Riordan, but I'm not telling this to the Dean of Engineering. <laughs> and I, I understood. So the Dean has never found out about that, but if he did, he'd say this was just great. <laughs> so four terrific guys. I'm delighted that so many have turned out tonight to, uh, uh, to honor four of my favorite colleagues. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm not a, much of a public speaker, and I, I don't have any prepared notes, so that makes it uh, even harder. But just I want to say a couple of uh, uh, words about uh, my happy uh, times here in uh, Carleton University and also at the Northern Telecom University. And uh, So basically I wanted, I, I came, came here to do uh, circuit design, uh, Professor Copeland, was the inventor of uh, switch capacitor filters, as most of you know. But uh, it so happened that um, Bob Haraway, who, is, uh, uh, who was my co-supervisor, he said, nothing doing. You know, you had to do the uh, modeling of the mismatch, and then on the side, you can do whatever you want. That, that was uh, OK. Then I, then I talked to you know, Professor Copeland hey, I'm, and I'm working on this, and then when would I, when do you think I'm going to finish this? His answer, I still remember, you will know it when you have done it. So that's the kind of freedom that, uh, you know, Miles and, and Bob uh, that gave to me, and so I, I'm, I'm ever so grateful to these two gentlemen here, and I always consider this, you know, uh, because of that or whatever, I, I consider Ottawa as my second home after, uh, after India. And uh, thank, thanks, Miles, and thanks, Bob, once again. So I uh, did my graduate studies with uh, Jim White as my supervisor. And I also had the good fortune to uh, take some classes and also... Uh, had my fourth year project supervised by Professor John Knight. I unfortunately didn't get a chance to work with uh, the other two uh, professors we're honoring here tonight, but everything I've heard says that I missed a good time there. Um, I just want to share a couple of things, I guess, one, uh, one about each of them. First, about uh, Jim White. Um, We've mentioned how many of uh, how many grad students he's had. The uh, the array of theses that coat his uh, coat his bookshelf, and uh, I've figured out why that uh, why that's possible. 
when, uh, when I was studying with him, I would see him for maybe a few minutes every month or two. And uh, in those few minutes, I would give him an indication of what I'd be doing, and he'd say maybe a sentence or two of direction. And I'd go away, and over the course of the next two or three months, I'd figure out that what he'd said was exactly what I needed to hear at that time, and point me in exactly the right direction. So that's a, that's a talent that few people have, I've found, and is of immense value, and has done a lot for, for me in terms of even beyond my studies here at Carleton, finding my direction in, uh, in my career. Um, John Knight I met really before I even started at Carleton. I had uh, talked to him in my considering which universities to go to. And um, one of the things really that made the, made the choice for me between Carleton and Waterloo in particular was the, the very human contact that we had here at Carleton, um, the, the focus on people, which was really exemplified in John Knight's approach at the very beginning and has since been exemplified by a lot of the professors and staff here. Um, this evening's event is really an example of that kind of emphasis and value that we put on people and I think that's been really an education beyond just a technical one for me. So I'd like to thank Professor Knight and Professor White, also Nagy, whose selfless uh, work in the department is really an example to all of us, and the rest of the faculty and staff who've shown me so much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Still on? Okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to admit I'm not an electrical engineering student or nothing else. I'm from the systems and doing my fourth year project with uh, Leonard McCarkin in the prosthetics hand. But I have an experience with John Knight. He might recognize me or not, but I was taking 2607 digital electronics. So for a systems guys, wow, you're doing something digital, a little bit programming, a little bit and and or, and and or. So I was coming up. And so what if, if you do like that? During the time, John Knight was not my prof. However, when I had any kind of question, I was so lucky that I could able to knock his door in the fifth floor, McKenzie, if I'm not doing a mistake. And he could able to actually, with his wheelchair, run down to the lab and help me out. And in my first lab in the electronics, in the 2607, there's like a big board with the and doors and XOR doors, and you get a wire, one end to other end, one end to other end, it's like a transatlantic movement going on. And he spent literally half an hour with a patient to say, redo everything again. And he waited me to complete the whole circuit. And he asked me a question, so are you electronics? I said, no, I'm in system. He said, that's why. You are not thinking the way that electronics people are supposed to think. So you're gonna take your time, Go one by one. Wire blue goes to here, and wire blue goes there. And during my 2607, the way that I learned the state diagrams actually with the moose head, the beer bottles. So you have basically six <laughs> moose head beer bottles. Starts from the six packs are the full, not the six packs on my belly, but <laughs> six packs that on the slides. And even he wasn't my teacher, every time I was so lucky that I could be able to, able to knock his door and ask him a question and he never hesitated to take his time and answer and I wanna say thank you again, at least formally and officially, to in front of everybody and hopefully I will finish my finals and graduate, I keep the ring, if not, maybe I can see you guys next year. <laughs> so thanks a lot again. Thank you, and I'm sure he speaks on behalf of many of the other students who had similar, similar experiences. Uh, so was there anybody else uh, who had something they wished to say? We've, we've had a lot of uh, emails of people that couldn't make it and uh, various comments that they wish to be shared, and I'm not sure if there's going to be a board somewhere where these comments will be displayed, but... Uh, uh, I also had a few words that I wanted to say myself about the legacy that these people have left. I only want to spend a few minutes, but for Roy, like every time you use a circuit simulator and you have a transistor model in it, 
Some of that may have come from the work of Roy Boothroyd. So he is known for circuit models, and he got his fellow of the IEEE because of his work with uh, circuit models internationally recognized. Also the fabrication facility, which has expanded. For Miles Copeland, like any time you design a fully integrated radio, probably requires some uh, frequency synthesizer, maybe sigma delta controlled in it. Miles Copeland was, uh, was at the start of that work along with other people or any analog circuits, and he taught me the value of intuition. People that have taken courses from him will know that he liked to do things by analogy, and then he would say it's a different manifestation of the same underlying reality. <laughs> so all the people who've taken courses from him will remember that, or he would blame it on shunt peaking. Anyway, so that's, uh, I, I took courses with him, was his graduate student, so remember that. For John Knight, uh, uh, digital circuit design, I believe he was the first person anywhere that made use of FPGAs. He recognized the value of them and used them in teaching and in research as well, so I think that was a, was a first. And, and, and as we have heard, a lot of students owe a lot to John Knight for, uh, uh, for the work he's done with them. And for Jim White, uh, I took a phase lock loop course with him, and uh, uh, that's where all of the phase lock loops I've learned about came from him. And also, I believe the anechoic chamber and the uh, Faraday cage is all due to him, so that's a legacy we have from, uh, from Jim White. So all of them mean a lot to the university, meant a lot and still do. The legacy, we go on, we have new students coming in, and so we like it if they can remember some of the things that these faculty members have done in the past and uh, remember that we're, we're building on the, on the work that they have done. So with that, maybe I will invite people to the dessert table. I've been told that if anybody has worries about allergies, ask the staff that's around there, uh, uh, for example, but there's uh, dessert, coffee, and tea, I believe, available in the back. Okay, thank you, and uh, we are open for a long night. I think the bar is open for quite a few hours left yet, so uh, uh, let's have a good evening.